Hello and welcome again to Back of the Net and Beyond, where today I'm going to be speaking to Leon Lloyd, who is a former rugby union player who played for Leicester Tigers, Gloucester and England. How are you doing? You okay? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Danny. Yeah, good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate your time. Um, how are you doing? How's life treating you at the moment? Yeah, sort of. It's, it goes quick. My Mondays, uh, one day I, you know, I wake up in the morning, think it's Monday. Right, I've got a week ahead of me. The next thing I know, it's Friday. Thinking, where's that week gone? Sort of. <laughs> everything is merging into each other. So I'm trying to stay focused and trying to stop myself at the weekend. At least I know when the, it's Saturday and Sunday. But apart from that, I'm keeping busy. That's it. Yeah. No, I know. I know exactly how you're feeling. I mean, I've, I've been off work uh, during the lockdown for, for well weeks and weeks now, um, and I went back on the first of June. So. Um, it's yeah, it's just getting back into um, kind of work mode, and like you said, the days just seem to merge into one. So, um, but yeah, I mean, can't really complain. Um, like I said, thanks for coming on. Um, if you want to just let people know what you're doing now in terms of day to day life, weekly life, um, just let people know what you're doing. Yeah, so I'm fortunate enough to uh, run a company, run a charity actually called Switch the Play. So we're Switch to Play Foundation, and we specialise in athlete career transition. Uh, that is helping athletes prepare for what comes next in their lives. So what not life after, not when they're finished playing, but whilst they're still playing, whilst they're still competing, what opportunities that are maybe out there that they can leverage and take advantage of whilst they're still playing. Uh, you know, we're very aware that a lot of athletes don't go on to fulfil their potential, and some leave in the academies, and some leave you know, the academy squads and get released. Some lose their their funding. Uh, mm -hmm. and don't get to go to the, the major tournaments and competitions. Some have career-ending injuries. There's a huge mix of different ones, but there's also, also some positive stories of people having, you know, great careers and long careers uh, and going out on their own terms. So there's a real mix, and uh, I feel very lucky to have one played sport. You mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, I played sport for a, a relatively long time, but then also still to be involved with sport. And every day is a different day. I can speak to a rower, this, you know, in the morning, and then a boxer in the afternoon, and a golfer in the evening, and then a football player the next day. So it's really uh, fascinating for me yeah. to work in that space. That's amazing. Um, I mean, we'll touch on more of that um, later on. But in terms of what you're doing, I think it's great just because me as a player or as a former player, when I was playing, I can, can never remember kind of anything of this kind of ilk when I was around, certainly. Um, it was always a case of, as you know, kind of you play and you're, you're immersed in your um, chosen sport and then you're not really thinking about what you're doing or what you may uh, might want to do when you've retired. Some players did. I mean, me, I personally didn't. Um, I always thought, well, if I don't make enough money to kind of do what I want afterwards, then I'm going to have to work. So that was my mindset, even though I was still trying to um, kind of achieve as much as possible whilst playing football. So for you to be uh, an ex-sports um, person, and obviously you kind of giving back um, to a certain degree, and obviously, you mentioned there you're speaking to a varied, um, a varied amount of people when it comes to sport background. So I think it's massive what you're doing. And like I said, we'll touch on more of that at a later date. Um, how, how long have you, not a later date, later on in the show, <laughs> um, how long have you been doing um, the business? How long have you been so I've, I've, I've been involved with Switch to Play since 2016, I think. Uh, I retired around 2000, retired from sport around 2000. And eight, nine, um, but I've always been involved in this transition piece because I, I struggled myself. When I finished, I finished with a career and injury at the age of 30, uh, and I, I found it really tough. Um, so I, I ended up writing a book. I was asked to write a book uh, or, or sort of write down my thoughts on if I had my time again, how would I do it differently? And I ended up writing a book called Life After Sport from Bootroom to Boardroom. And again, it's not about my career and how good I thought I was. Uh, although uh, I've very fortunate to have a pretty decent career and played a long time at and some, some couple of good clubs. It's mm -hmm. more about if I had my time again, what would I do differently? So the ultimate highs, the devastating lows, but more importantly, all the bits in between in the middle. Because you don't, you're right, you don't think about uh, what you're going to do next when you're playing because you're always thinking Saturday to Saturday to Saturday. Yeah. And you always, you always think, oh, you know what, I will think about that, but I'll think about it next week or next season. or But then something else gets in the way. So, mm. yeah, it's more a case than I finished early. A lot of my teammates were still playing. Um, so I knew that they were going to go through and I was far more prepared than what they were so I know if I found it tough they were definitely going to find it tough as well yeah. so I, I sort of I floated around in my own thing for let's say four, five, six years and then through a mutual friend Steve Mitchell who was involved with Switch to Play at the time we played rugby together 
and it coincided with me writing my book and publishing my book. He approached me and said, look, would you want to get involved with these guys, with us and the guys? Uh, and I, I joined them then and we joined and sort of converted to a social enterprise. Uh, we managed to recruit Beth Tweddle, yeah. the former uh, Jimmy Gymnast. As mm-hmm. one of our uh, one of our directors at the time, and then only recently we converted to a charity only in February. So we've sort of come full circle round. We've got a great team of trustees and ambassadors mm-hmm. and associates, all giving back, all mm-hmm. trying to help the next uh, generation of athletes uh, learn from our mistakes, if you like, and those mistakes that have gone before us. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's re- it's really rewarding. You're right; it's a really rewarding job. The fact we've got charitable status is is really important for us. It means now we can offer our services to a far wider audience and cost can be removed, so there's no hurdle of cost. Uh, mm-hmm. But I suppose the main part of the job is to try and, I say educate people, in inverted commas, um, to understand that it's not a, not to see what we do as a plan B, it's actually we're an extension of your plan A, so don't think when you're talking to somebody, not just us, because there are lots of other good organisations out there, there are player associations out there that do great work, but yeah. see that as an advantage and how you can actually use that to be better at your, your day job, be that mm-hmm. throwing a javelin, diving into a pool, hitting a golf ball, whatever it may be, doing mm. these other things can actually make you better at that as well. Whereas I suppose in our day, it probably wasn't like that. It's probably, if you're doing those things, that's a distraction. You know, get your head on, you've got a game at the weekend, focus on the weekend. But thankfully, yeah. the, the world's changed, sport's changed, and it's not like that now. Yeah, I mean, you say it's not like that now, but I've heard a few stories where, in some ways, it is. Um, and it's just frustrating because sport in general, rugby, football, they're kind of, They've got so much financial backing, but in some ways they're still stuck in the dark ages. And I kind of resonate with what you say in terms of kind of extent as an extension of your plan A, rather than thinking about maybe a plan B or, or kind of further down the line. Okay, well, I've got a bad injury now. What? Um, it's kind no, of exactly. Exactly. And you know, we found that when people were coming to us when they were seeing us as their plan B, they already think they've failed at plan A, so they come with their shoulders down and their they're yeah. dejected, they're, still, they're not really into it, they're not buying into the benefits of it. So it's just a change of, so a change of narrative really about this is yeah. by doing these things actually makes you better. There's research now that shows it'll make you better at your, at your job. Yeah. So there's a positive side, but there's a positive stance on it. Definitely, yeah. I mean, the stats are out there and the figures as well in terms of kind of athletes who are actually doing something uh, alongside um, like performing on a daily basis, they actually perform better when they've got a yeah. lot of field, not distraction, but uh, an interest. Um, yeah. because they're kind of not then thinking, well, okay, well, I'm playing football, rugby, tennis, whatever it may be. Um, and then in the back of my head, what am I doing afterwards? It's a case of, well, I know I've got that there and I'm enjoying it and it's progressing nicely. It's allowing me to perform better on the pitch um, or whatever it may be that you're doing in sport. So the, the figures are there. So I'm surprised that not many kind of, or not more, teams, organisations are like pushing that narrative. So it's, it's great what you're doing. Um, how does it work then? Because I've, I've got the gist of it in terms of like, obviously transitioning from sport. Um, but how does it work? Do the players approach you or you approach them or is it a bit of both? A bit of both really. We, um, people can reach out to us. We're, we're very different. So obviously you've got the PFA, so the yeah. Professional Football Association, the, the RPA for rugby, the LTA for tennis, the PGA for golf and all those EIS for Olympic and Paralympic sports. But they'll all they'll only work after look after their one group of athletes. Where we at Switch to Play, we work with across all sports and right. all ages and everything else. So we're quite unique in that sense mm. uh, that we work across all. So we can take learnings from each different sport and pass that and share that around and create best practice. So we, we so we have individuals who, who approach us, and because we're independent, so sometimes yeah. a football player might not want to approach his club or the PFA because he may think that's going to impact his selection. Or yeah. impact a decision what the what the gaffer says or what the lads say. So they, that that means they sort of land with us. Also, you get disgruntled people who have lost their funding and they don't want to go and speak to their NGB, their, their national government body. So they come and speak to us. But what we try and tend to do is we've been quite big on trying to work on prevention rather than cure. So yeah. what, what I mean by that is not again trying to get people to come to us and work with us at an earlier age. We work with academies. So for example, we work with the Premier League. Um, yeah. We go into all the Premier League clubs and deliver sessions to their academies from the under-12s up to the under-23s, mm. helping them understand that, you know, some of you may go on and have an amazing career and play for the Premier League, uh, mm. and, you know, and play for international football. Some yeah. of you may not. Some of you may still go and have an, an, an amazing career mm. and just play at the lower leagues. But equally, yeah. some of you are not going to play at all. Uh, mm. So it's important that we get that balance right because we're not dream crushers. 
So if you've got the chance to play football, you know, my dream was to play football. If you've got the chance to play football for a job and get paid, then definitely do it. You know, and, and then yeah. we'd, never, we'd never tell anyone not to do it and not to give it 100%. But, but what we do say is, you can do other things as well. It's not just, don't put all your eggs in that basket. Doing these other things will, will, will make you a better football player, as we said, but also it will make you think about things differently. You'll have better perspective. I know when I was playing, if I had a, when I didn't really have, there was a period in my career when I didn't have much perspective. So I'd go and play a game. Uh, and then if I played, whether I played good, bad or indifferent, I'd rush home after the match finished uh, and I'd watch it on TV and this is how old I am. I'd, I'd, read, the tele, I'd read teletext, see what teletext said about the game and then I'd, I'd, listen to the com- I'd listen to the commentary and if the commentators picked up any mistakes or spoke negatively about me, I had nothing, I had no escape. And that was me yeah. and then I thought, I've got a week now so I've got to put it right. And then it was like mm-hmm. a downward spiral. It's only when I had something else which was... Uh, which took my mind off it. You know, I say distraction, but it probably was a distraction. I'm something to take my yeah. mind off so I can play and give it my all. And then good, bad, or in different games, so you always try your hardest. At least then I can go away and think, well, I've got this to focus on now. Then I can revisit that on Monday, the sport yeah. on Monday, and then sort of have that balance. So we try and work with clubs and organisations uh, to try and get in there early on with their, their athletes. Yeah. And I say athletes because it's not just football players or players or cricketers. We have got... Yeah. You know, gymnasts, tennis, tennis players, and all those types of things as well. So it's a it's a real mix, but we want to try and work with more and more clubs um, so that we can deliver sessions to more and more athletes across across the scope. Really, wow, that sounds massive and it sounds really exciting. Um, in terms of the clubs you're dealing with, uh, the organisations are they quite receptive in terms of what kind of service you're looking to offer them? Yeah, they, yeah, they are, and I think I think that's come from uh, uh, over time. People have become more open to the opportunity um, yeah. and seeing what seeing what's available. But yes, they yes they'll have their, their player associations and individual support networks that are there. So we we for one are not one saying that we're the only people in the space. So we just focus on what we can deliver. And I've certainly yeah. found now as as players as, as coaches have uh, got older. So my my generation, my age of players now are now becoming coaches, and they've experienced um, the difficulties of transitioning. So they're definitely more receptive to understanding, do you know what, I want to look after my players, I want, what can I do to help them? So that, that's been, I've definitely seen a massive change. Equally, there's more and more people talking about their challenges now, the more and more high profile people talking about how they struggle yeah. um, where before they didn't do that and it's sort of the people suffered in silence. So now we're hearing more and more stories about those high profile ones, but for every high profile uh, player or athlete, there are hundreds, if not thousands of, the, of athletes that we've never heard of that are also struggling. So that's really yeah. where we're trying to get to that, that you know, the, the, the cooks of it. Yeah, you make a good point. And that's something I've been kind of concerned about um, recently because, again, it's kind of, in some ways, it's easier for a high-profile player to get help um, just because of their, their profile. Naturally, it carries some weight. But like you just said there, for every kind of, one or two high-profile athletes uh, who are struggling that maybe come out and voice their kind of uh, situation. There's a thousand, if not more, yeah. uh, like um, lesser-known athletes who are, are still struggling. May not be struggling in the silence, but in terms of your kind of uh, profile, it shouldn't. Your profile shouldn't be factored into how much help you get. It should be regardless of who you are. You should receive the same amount of, of help from that perspective. Um, yeah, so you're right. Yeah, well, sorry, sorry, Dan. I was going to say you're right, but on, on the flip side of that, there's um, you've got the, the people because if you play, let's use football, use football, you know, use your sport as an example. Mm. If you, you, most people, I said to you before, my dream was to play football. Most young men, young boys, dream of playing football for their country. Yeah. And uh, so when someone there, when they see one of their heroes playing football, and, and they come out publicly complain, uh, or not complain, so that, that's the wrong word actually. They, they publicly come out and say. You know, it's really tough. I'm no longer playing football anymore. It's really tough. Mm. The, the natural, the human instinct would say, well, as a fan, you've just lived my dream. You know, you've played in front of thousands of people. You're earning however, many, however much money per week. And now you're looking for sympathy from me. Absolutely no chance. Jog on. Yeah. Whereas the actual, the player's not looking for sympathy. They're just no. saying how they feel because there's a void in their life which is now needs to be filled. Mm. Uh, so that's why a lot of people don't come out and talk about it because they know they're, they're privileged and they've, they've worked hard for it, but they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're in a privileged position. But mm. the people come, there's a perceptive a perception that just because you've earned money and you've got money in the bank, that you can't be struggling. You can't find it. What have you got to be uh, uh, complaining about? You've got loads, you've got a big car, a nice house, all those things. But it's not about that. You know, no, the, issues that, the issues and the challenges that we 
talk to people about. Very rarely, yeah, m- m- finance is, is a, a challenge, yeah. but very rarely is that the main challenge for people. You know, it's a factor, and yeah, don't get me wrong, it is a big factor, but there's other things. There are lots more factors that people struggle with. Definitely. Um, I suppose the athletes in general, they, they kind of um, they resonate with yourself. Uh, there's a connection there naturally because you've been uh, a sports person yourself. Um, do you find that's the case, or am I just kind of just sometimes? <laughs> yeah, so, so, sometimes as well because rugby is a, a weird game, isn't it? So yeah. I, I speak for especially if you play football, you, you sort of think well, it's not really a sport. I did, I did a set, I did a session with um, with Arsenal uh, last season, and yeah. they, I sat at the table with these these guys. So they were good lads, actually, really good good squad mm-hmm. lads, uh, the under 23s, and they didn't know who I was. They didn't know yeah. that my background was rugby, yeah. and I was the I was the, the keynote speaker, uh, and I was talking, saying, "Oh, oh lads, um, what do you do?" And I said, "Oh, I, I like I like rugby." And um, they went, "Oh, that's not even a sport. That's just big guys running into each other." And oh, I was sat there thinking, "Oh, that's going to be. A, I've got a tough crowd here ahead of me yeah. now." But, but, but when when you explain um, the experience that you go through as an athlete, that so you, if you get injured, it's the same regardless of the sport. The, the rehab is tough. The yeah. selection is tough. Uh, having to move clubs is tough. All mm. those things, it doesn't matter what sport you play and also yeah. what level you play. If you played, you understand it. So I, I found that initially it was quite difficult to be accepted because they say, well, what do you know? You don't really know about football. But mm. I don't need to know about football. I don't yeah. need to know the ins and outs of a, of a football game plan. I understand the human, the, the mindset and the psychology around the transition and the impact it can have and what makes a, a positive and negative one. So once mm. I share that bit, and, I, and I, obviously I share my my credentials to get me a bit of credibility that I've actually been there and I've sort of worn the t-shirt. Then I see the guard gets dropped and then yeah. people are more open to talking about stuff. Mm. And, that sort of, and that, that's the most important thing. It's not about me. You know, I know mm. I've been through my, my transition. I'm still transitioning now and I've been retired for, for 12 years. So it's all, you're yeah. always evolving. It's yeah, more about helping that person I'm, person I'm talking to really. Mm. Um, in terms of your transition then, obviously from playing rugby and you played at a high level and you sustained a career for a long period of time. Um, how did you find the transition? Obviously going from, you mentioned you retired, I think, uh, through injury. Uh, so obviously that was out of your hands. Did that make it a little bit more difficult because it wasn't your own choice? Um, I think it would have been tough for me to decide to hang up the boots uh, mm. if, if it was my decision. I know not very many, I don't, know what the, I don't know exactly what the stat is of how many athletes get to choose when they're in their career, but not very many do. Because uh, you always think you'll go again and go and go out, you want to go out of the top, but then you think you might squeeze another year out. So retiring at 30 uh, for a career in injury, it came out of the blue for me because I had lots of injuries on my, you know, rugby's a, a combative sport, so I had, I had six operations on my right knee. Uh, so I always thought that was going to be the one that ended my career. Yeah. So for probably the last three or four years of my playing career, I was in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, in all sports, you're only one injury away, but certainly in rugby, you're thinking one big hit, one, you know, badly timed tackle, that's me done. And if, I'm, and if you're thinking about that, when you're playing and approaching a game with some big games as well, you're not really thinking about, you know, you're full focused on what you're doing on the, on the day. So, yeah. so I, suppose, I suppose that was, that was a challenge. Uh, it wasn't actually, ironically, it wasn't my right knee that ended my career, it was my left knee, which okay. was uh, absolutely fine. I had no injuries on that knee at all. But because my right knee was so badly damaged, I'd sort of ran differently over the, the, the years and I'd worn that yeah. down. I ended up having two, two dodgy knees in the end. So, so, so that blindsided me. It took me by surprise. I went in for an operation thinking I'd be back on the training paddock within three to four weeks, just a routine clear out on my left knee. And then when I came round from the surgeon's knife and he said, you know, he couldn't, he, he couldn't fix it, that was a, a bit of a shock because you know, we knew each other quite well because he'd operated on me a number of times. We had, we had that relationship, uh, so he knew it was going to hit me quite hard because I wasn't prepared for that. Um, yeah, it, it was tough. It, it, it was really tough to start off with. I didn't do anything. You know, I just for a year, I just didn't do anything at all. And I had that had that thing. Yeah, I had that thing where we just had a, our daughter, our first daughter actually. Uh, and I was living in Cheltenham. I mean, we were walking around Cheltenham, uh, like shopping with our, our, you know, with Renee. And at three o'clock on a Saturday, I'm walking around Cheltenham. But three o'clock on a Saturday for me is game day. My whole life, three o'clock on a Saturday is game day. And I'm thinking, yeah. I shouldn't be here, I should be somewhere else. And I found that really tough uh, mm-hmm. to deal with. I also found it tough that the team carried on playing without me. They didn't miss me at all. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. and, and rightly so, because you're sort of a small part of a big, big machine. But you sort yeah. of want your team to miss, miss you a little bit. You don't want them to lose, but you want them to go, oh, it's not quite the same without Lloydie. Yeah. That didn't happen. 
that didn't happen. They just carried on. Uh, and, and then you sort of realise then I sort of went through a bit of guilt because yeah. I felt guilty for all those, my other teammates who retired and I didn't give them a second thought. You know, when they retired, I hadn't appreciated what they may have been going through. So then I felt guilty that if they felt like anything like I did, then they'll be in a, you know, it'd be tough for them as well. So I sort of had these roller coasters of emotions going through in a, in a new city with a, with a new child. So yeah, it was really, it was really tough. It was really tough. And that, that, I suppose that's led me to get on this path of, of doing what I'm doing at the moment. Okay. And in terms of playing for, for Leicester and Gloucester, like, and obviously England as well, just you want to touch on that a little bit? Like, how did that make you feel in terms of your career? Yeah, that was awesome. You know, I, I grew up in, uh, in Coventry, born in a city Coventry, uh, dreamed to play football. Uh, but my senior school played rugby. They didn't play football, really. So I was forced to play. I used to get into a bit of trouble at school. So I was, I was quite a quick runner. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't mind getting involved in a scrap. So yeah. that they put those two together and that sort of <laughs> comes up with the, the, the formula of a rugby player. Yeah. Uh, but, then, but back then it wasn't professional sports. It wasn't a career choice. Uh, yeah. The game turned pro in 96. I signed for Leicester. I played at school. I played for, for Coventry schools and Warwickshire schools, Midland schools and England. I suppose played for England schools in the 16s. Yeah. And from that match, I got selected to go to Leicester Tigers at the age of 16 as a game turned pro. So again, right time, right place. I signed pro. I lived with um, Martin Johnson, who I don't know if you know, but he was a former Leicester England captain oh, yeah. who won the World Cup. So it was yeah. great for me to go and back to the fire straight out of Coventry, live with Martin Johnson, put me on the straight and narrow. Uh, and then I was, I was sort of embedded within this culture of great players. You know, that their standards and their professionalism was awesome. And I was yeah. a young 16, 17 year old kid, and I was being dragged along by these guys, training extra, doing extra, eating well understanding what professors are men at such a young age I, I sort of grew up people think I'm about 70 because I've sort of I've been, got, I've been with those guys for that long that my mindset yeah. and my you know I believe you're a product of your environment and I was very yeah. lucky to have been with those guys who were world-class players who you know, most of them went on to win a World Cup themselves mm. so that sort of put me on my path I made my debut for Leicester so I'm pro at 16 made my debut for Leicester at 17 um, a very young age and then yeah. fortunately Played at Leicester for 13, 14 seasons, oh, you know, amassing a lot of games and winning. Winning a, we had a good seat. We had a very good squad, as I said, with some world class players. So we won lots of, lots of trophies. Won the Heineken Cup, which is the equivalent to the Champions League in football. We won that back to back. So mm. I look back on my time there with real, real fond memories. Uh, and yes, it's great to win trophies, and mm. that's why that's why you play sport. But the, the squad and the team I played with, they're amazing. You know, I learned so much yeah. on the field and off the field from those guys. And then, then I moved to Gloucester, and although we didn't, I was only there for one year before my knees packed in, and yeah. I, we didn't win anything there, but great environment, great group of lads, some, again, some world-class players there. So yeah, I was yeah. glad to experience that as well. That's massive. In terms of Leicester, because I know you said you were there for years, so I'm, I'm assuming when I was at Leicester, because I was at Leicester from the age of, uh, well, Leicester City from the age of 16 to around 20, 21. So I'm talking about from like 98 to 2001-2-ish. So we yeah. were Leicester Tigers then. Yeah, that's where that was when we were at Leicester City. That was Martin O'Neill era, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I remember, so I remember, I remember that. Tigers a lot on the local radio and I'm sure yeah. the team was doing really well from what I can remember. Yeah, I remember that year. That year, the football, because there's a, there's, a, there's a statue in the centre of Leicester because the, the football, so you guys won the Coca-Cola Cup. Yeah. We won. We won the league. Uh, we won our league, and we won the the Hunting Cup. And I think yeah. the cricketers won the 2020. Uh, yeah. And I think the Leicester Riders won something as well. And they put uh, this statue up. I think we always used to see the football. The footballers out in town at the usual yeah. haunts. But it was it was a great time. A great time to be playing for yeah. any Leicester any Leicester side. I remember um, you touched on like Mike out and that. I mean, I was only a youngster, so that that. Um, cup winning team. I was in the squad, but I was just in the stands. So I travelled and stuff. I was only what 17, 18. So that was a great experience. I actually went the year before, and I think I think we lost uh, from what I can remember. But yeah, same similar experience. But you said about Mike out, and I remember went out a few times in Leicester, and I remember seeing like the rugby players and people talk about footballers on a night out, but like rugby players are different different kettle of fish. And I remember seeing Martin Johnson because I'm only five foot seven. <laughs> and like Martin Johnson's like a man mountain. I just remember like there's about eight or nine rugby players came in, like happy as Larry, um, cheerful, friendly, but they were just just different. As in 
just how they like carried themselves, how they drank their drinks and just doing crazy stuff. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but... I'm yeah, thanks, sure thanks. But probably best not to. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, were, they were good days. They were, and, and also at the time as well, as I said, we were, we were successful. I think we had a, sort of like a six or seven year in beating home record. Yeah. So if we're out in Leicester, then we're usually celebrating. Uh, and we, did, we knew how to let our hair down. We, we knew how to celebrate uh, a yeah. win. We also knew how to... Uh, drown our, you know, commiserate and drown our losses as well. So we, we had we had fun. Win, win, lose or draw, we had fun. Good times. And um, do you miss playing at all? No. No. See, see I didn't even hesitate. See, see, I didn't even hesitate to answer that question. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> not. My body's my body's quite sore. Uh, okay. Shoulders, knees, you know, hands. I, what I do miss, I miss those things that you talked about. You know, the the, the, yeah. the times with the guys, the. The, the few minutes before kickoff, when you're in the tunnel and it's just you and the guys, you know how much work you put in, and the game plan's ready to go, and you look around, ready to go to war, mm. and then you um, and then you, the get the game finishes, and again, win, lose or draw, you look around, and you see everyone's faces battered, and there's blood everywhere, and mm. you're in the change room. Do those few minutes? I miss the minute, few minutes before kickoff, and a few minutes after kickoff. That yeah. is gold dust. It's hard. It's hard to replicate that right? and now. You know, it's difficult to replicate that in the real world. So that's the bit I miss. I miss the lads. I miss that camaraderie. But I'm lucky because it's switched to play. We have the same, we instill the same values in our teamwork. Although we don't go out and kick 10 bells of crap at each other on a yeah. weekly basis. We yeah. have that same ethos and same culture and, and values. I want it to be fun. And it didn't feel like rugby was never a job for me. Um, I got paid to do something that I was half decent at. But I love doing it with, people, with good friends. So yeah. for me, that means you, you know, if you don't work a day in your life, that's my aim, is to go through life not feeling like I'm working. That's it. Good stuff. Um, in terms of, obviously, we touched on retirement and the reasons and kind of how you transitioned. Um, did you get much help from kind of anyone within rugby, former teammates or uh, friends or any organisation at all? No, there wasn't a switch to play around when I was, uh, you know, when I finished 12 years ago. There was the RPA and there was a, a chap there who was a development manager called Tim Nichol who helped me write my first CV. But, but, but because I'd sort of, I'd, I was, had my fingers in lots of pies when I was playing, so I was networking quite a lot, and the yeah. perception was that I'd be all right because I'd had, you know, I'd, I was quite astute and business-minded. So mm -hmm. when I did actually retire, people just left me to myself, thought, oh, Lord, you'd be all right because he'd yeah. done a lot of, lot of stuff. And then it was difficult for me then to come out and say, do you know what, guys, I'm not actually all right, because yeah. everyone thought I was. Yeah. And if you've, got, if you've got people like Martin Johnson and... and Neil Back and Austin Healy and all these guys said, "Our oh, Lloyd is fine. You know, he'll smash it." Mm. You sort of, you sort of don't want to go back and say, "Well, I'm not." So you, you know, I just sort of kept myself to myself and just, yeah, yeah, just, just struggled along for the first 12, 24 months. Mm. But yeah, Tim Nichols from the RPA helped me write my first ever CV and prepared me for my first ever proper job, uh, yeah. other than a paper round. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it, it. Was I look back at that time? God, it seems a long time ago now. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so. Because obviously business, there's a lot of strands and facets that come into it. Finance, obviously recruitment and various things, office space. How did you find coping with all of that? Was that kind of all down to you or did you have like a little team around you? Or What do you mean, what do you mean now as we to play, do you mean, or, or initially when I finished? Um, a bit of both, if you can touch on a bit of both. Yeah, so I set up a, I set up a company whilst I was playing, a concierge company. Because uh, I was, uh, as I say, I, I had my fingers in lots of pies, and I saw a gap in the market for uh, for a service, a, concert, a lifestyle service. We used to sign lots of overseas players, yeah. so Fijians, South Africans, Kiwis, Aussies. The yeah. French guys came over, and when they came over, they didn't really have any idea of Leicester as a city. So mm. I set up a business where I'd be able to find, I'd be able to get that they couldn't get uh, rents because they didn't have a contract. They had got no, yeah. they didn't have three months' wages. So I set up. Uh, an agreement and I stood guarantor for all the new signings so they can get car leases, rent yeah. apartments, uh, the schools for their children, uh, taxes and chauffeur services, restaurants, babysitters, all those things that when you go to a new place, yeah. what do you need? And you want yeah. to take the pressure off your, your partner because you, if you're going to the rugby club and you've got your job to do mm -hmm. and your partner is, uh, has, has obviously been moved out of somewhere else, a different place mm -hmm. to come and you sort of settled there. My job is to try and make uh, their partners feel welcome so I organised things with the wives and girlfriends mm. uh, so that meant that the boys could then focus on the day job and get the best out of them so mm. I, I sort of set up a business and I was running that business whilst I was still playing which, yeah. um, which enabled me to have that bit of distraction if you like from the, the match day on the Saturday Saturday so I had some understanding yeah 
how to run a business. However, because I didn't need the money, that, that job, I just, I'd use that experience to learn how to run a business. Why? Because I, I had my salary. When I'd finished, and then you can't practice then because you've got bills to pay, so you need to have a business yeah. that actually makes money. So that's very different. And you make different choices and different decisions. So yeah, it was quite a, a bit of a, a rude awakening. Yeah. Uh, I got my first job was at uh, Oakham School. Okay. And I worked in there as a, a foundation director uh, in charge of the fundraising of scholarships and bursaries. That was my first ever proper job. Um, but again, it was good fun. It was tough. It was out of my comfort zone. I didn't want to go in sport. I didn't want to stay in sport because everyone thought that I'd become a coach or I'd go down that route. Um, mm. But I just wanted, because the way I ended my, my career ended, I wanted to step away from sport. So I wanted to okay. do something completely different. Uh, mm. And that's what I did. I stepped away completely out, out of it and didn't do anything to do with rugby at all. Mm. Wow, I mean, one thing that I kind of struck me there, it must have been a, a lot of pressure on your shoulders because obviously if you're still playing, then you've got the concierge business, which is great, but then you've got the concern of the players' wives, girlfriends, children, and everyone needs to be settled and whatever else. Um, but you said that you were guarantors for all of those different kind of variants, so rent contracts and things like that with different estate agents and whatever else. Didn't, didn't you feel a bit nervous just in case? Because as you know, anything can happen in sport. Um, yeah. All signs for two years and then six months in, it doesn't work out and they're gone. So then, like, you obviously need to factor in all those things. And you must have been thinking, I hope kind of things don't go like left field, if that makes sense. Because obviously, if you're going yeah, to be a responsibility. It is, yeah. But, but youth, naivety of youth. <laughs> everything was there, you know, that everyone was buying houses, everything was yeah. interest rates were low, there's no risk and you've got a job and you think you've got a, you think you're set for life, you think you're Superman, you think you're invincible. So I probably didn't I probably just, just kept going and just ramping it up and gearing everything up the whole time. And I didn't really see that as as a risk. Again, I was more lucky than anything else, I suppose, because the markets didn't turn at the time and I learnt I learnt a lot. I learned a lot about how to manage people, I learned about relationships. I learned all those that network, how to network, which is one of the biggest skills you can learn, I think, as a, as a, as a current athlete. So mm -hmm. I did all those things whilst I was, whilst I was playing. Um, would I recommend that to a, to a current athlete now? Probably not, probably not as much. I'd, de I'd definitely recommend doing something, but yeah. I probably bit more than I could chew and I was doing lots of other things. Um, and you could tell if my form was affected, then my coach would pull me in uh, wow. and tell me to refocus on, on the day job and what I'm being paid to do. So uh, again, that, that enabled me to get another member of staff in. So then I learned how to manage somebody. So I got somebody in, and I think I was mid early mid twenties, and I've already got some people who I was managing as right. part of the company. Uh, so I'm learning as I'm going along, yeah. uh, really. Because I didn't go to university. You know, my, my university studies have come later in life. Uh, but at the yeah. time, I hadn't done that. I left school at a young age, so I was learning those things as I was going along. Wow, that's massive. And it must have been a burden to a certain degree, like you said. Obviously, if things are taking a lot of time off the field, I can understand why the manager would maybe call you and say, look, you've not been playing well for a couple of games. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've seen that many, many times with different players that I've come across with in various different teams. Um, in terms of your transition then, like what transferable skills did you take from playing rugby and being in that kind of environment to obviously doing what you're doing now? I think there are loads of transferable skills. It's one of the masterclasses, one of my favourite masterclasses that we deliver at Switch to Play is our transferable skills masterclass. Uh, but as, a, as an athlete, you get told you've got lots of transferable skills. But mm. unless you know what they are, there's no point having them. And then even if you know what they are, unless you know how to use them in a different environment, they're yeah. not transferable. Yeah. Uh, so you can reel off all the ones that the stats say about uh, leadership qualities, uh, flexibility, uh, resilience is a big one for me, the big thing yeah. for me. You've been able to bounce back from mm. not being picked uh, being injured, how do you come back? You know, you've got a shoulder reconstruction, you're all out for six months. You, how do you focus and you attend to the detail to get back? Yeah. I suppose what the, the big, one of the biggest differences between the real world uh, and sport is I don't know any other environment where you, you both, two people are vying for the same spot for a cup final shirt. And, and I've been on the, the positive end of that and I've been picked. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, my, the person who's missed out has come up to me and congratulated me and helped me. And then I've also been on the receive the other end where I've not been picked for a cup final. And then it's my job to go up to them and say, look, congratulations. Anything I can do to help you get ready for the game at the weekend, mm -hmm. let me know. And that's massive, right? Yeah. Someone, someone, someone has just got your, your shirt that you think is your shirt and they're playing it, but you're still doing your bit for the team, your teamwork element. That's mm -hmm. massive. And that, I don't see that very much in the outside of sport. 
Uh, and I miss that. I do miss that because that's how it all. We all want to have that shirt. We all want to win. But when you're not there, you do what you can to make the team uh, team succeed. Definitely. That is massive. And it's true. <clears throat> like I said, um, obviously, you know the reasons why I'm doing the podcast. And it's basically just to let people know that athletes do have transferable skills, which are obviously suited to other industries and not just sport. Um, and I don't think, like you said there, I don't think many athletes are aware that they've got the transferable skills. And if they are aware, they may not know how to utilize them. Um, yeah. Many industries out there that are crying out for kind of athletes to, to jump on and like jump on board and be part of the team. Um, but it's up to the athlete to a certain degree to, to showcase those skills. So you mentioned early on about your CV and things like that. And I, I wrote my own CV. Um, and again, not many athletes will be aware of how to, to compile a CV. Because no one's interested in how many games you played or yeah. uh, like how many injuries you had or how many medals you've got. You need to know, okay, well, the job I'm looking to go for, they want to they want to have, they want to employ someone who's got X, Y, and Z. So then you need to showcase that and not just write it down. You need to back it up. So when I say back it up, you need to, when you have the face-to-face interview or however it may be formatted, explain what you've done to showcase that you've actually got those skills. And that's just a small part of it. Um, again, you need to have the gumption to actually go out there and network, which isn't as easy as people think. Um, pick up the phone and ask for help, like you were saying earlier. So it's about kind of shedding that pride, if that makes sense, uh, in some ways. Um, it is. I, you, that. You, you, hit, so you, make, you make some good points there. And that's what one of the, I suppose, our USPs at Switch to Play is we help people develop their CV in a digital format. So that way, so like you said, you could have a 15 year, 20 year career. And you could have scored all the goals, been captain, won loads of trophies. But when you put that on a normal CV when you apply for a job, that's probably a paragraph yeah. or best two paragraphs. Yeah. And that doesn't show who you are when you're not playing sport. So what we've done is our, pro, our, our membership's called Switched On. And it's a free, it's a, for athletes, for any athlete, it's free to, uh, to become a member. And what we do is we help you build your digital CV. So yes, you can have a, you can have a section on your career stats, but that's and highlights of you playing and scoring goals or winning medal, whatever you're doing. But that's yeah. just a small part of who you are. Then you've got another part which says, well, here I am, I'll do some community work. And it's got you doing all the community work that you do. Then there might be another bit where you do some charity work. You might have an interest in mm. cars or gardening or baking or cooking or whatever it might be. And then you can show what your interests are there. You've got your yeah. different hobbies, all the different things. And, and it gives an overall picture of who you are. So it won't replace your CV mm. because that's not how the world works. But what it does with your CV, which might be a bit light because you've spent 10, 15, 20 years playing sport, sending this link with all those, inside each collection, all those different things that showcase who you are, far, far more powerful. It gives you an understanding of um, yeah, who you are, what motivates you, what your values are. Yeah. And I, I think uh, how our athletes have used it, those, those who want to go into the media, you know, if they've done lots of interviews on the radio or, or on, on print, on TV, you can capture those interviews. So on a, on a paid basis, you might say, uh, keen on media or done some media interviews but there's nothing better than saying see my see my membership profile and in that you click on it and there's 20 uh, video YouTube clips of you doing in- interviews with people yeah. or, or articles you've written or things you've contributed towards because that's actually that's the evidence that you're showing to your potential employer that's massive I mean I feel a bit jealous and I'm not a jealous type of person just because as you know when we were younger we didn't have anything like this nah. um, and you mentioned there, I mean, I've never really heard of a digital CV, but from an athlete's perspective, sure, that bodes well, surely, because most of the things that you've achieved will be either in front of a camera, as in face-to-face talking to someone when you're being interviewed, or maybe in a group session, or actually competing in your chosen sport. So if you can say, right, okay, well, I'm resilient, and then you can show yourself where you've got an injury and you're out for eight months and you're on the treatment table, and then next minute you're playing in a team, like, eight months later and you're successful winning the cup or something, that shows resilience. So it backs up you writing it down on paper that you've got resilience. Um, if I was an athlete now and I heard that this service was available, I'd, definitely, I'd jump on it straight away because... I know, it seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? It seems like a no-brainer. It wasn't around when we were younger, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. it's just, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think it's amazing what you're doing in the service. And I'm, I'm glad you came on because it, it resonates with the reason why I'm doing the podcast because... We're both here. I mean, my podcast is just a podcast at the end of the day, and I'm trying to get people's message across. But it's about the same thing that you're trying to do, transitioning transferable skills. And obviously, 
you're you're doing it kind of in a different way. Um, but it's just it frust- it frustrates me that athletes are there and that they're, they're sometimes they're just seen as assets, as you know. Um, but they've got so many skills, and whenever I talk to people, especially when I was playing, the time was always seen as a negative, and whoever was coming in and talking to us, the delivery was just so negative. So that's why a lot of athletes aren't maybe receptive to when it comes to like talking about retirement. I mean, I always say something I was talking about the other day. If someone says, um, there's two ways you can talk about retirement in a nutshell. And it's, if someone's asking you a question, well, what are you going to do after you play rugby? Your answer then, your head's kind of thinking, well, actually, that's a bit of a negative question. Whereas someone, if someone approached you and said, what are you going to do to help people once you finish playing? It's a different, you're looking at it from a different perspective. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does make it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that. I, I tend to use the um, well, retirement's been banned. We don't we, we we stop using the word retirement and switch to play because that's quite formal. <laughs> and we, we work on transitioning to the out of retirement. They yeah. retire when you're 60, 70, or whatever it might be. But yeah. what I found works really well is when you say if you look at the word transition itself, mm-hmm. and you're going to transition, be 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 positive about what you transition. Look forward to transitioning into something rather yeah. than transitioning away from something. So if you mm-hmm. transition away. You always be looking back and reflecting on Definitely. what it was before. But if you yeah. put things in place and you plan ahead, and then yeah. you, you can get positive and confident and happy, excited about the thing you're transitioning into, then it, straight away it's a mindset shift. You still, at the end of the day, you're still moving from, you, you're stopping the sport and getting something else. But if you can be, get excited about it and plan and put things in place, then you can be, you're moving towards something. And that's the, men, that's the, the mindset of an athlete anyway. They want to be competitive. They need targets, they're very target, very motivated, attention yeah. to the detail. So make sure you've still got that. Just that your target might not be winning a cup, winning a trophy, doing this. It might be something else. So it's just making sure that you've got that so you're transitioning into it as opposed to, as I say, always looking back. That's a great point. Um, in terms of switch to play, um, if you want to just let people know where you can be found, again, just touch on briefly kind of the service that you offer. Yeah, so we, so we specialise in transition, not life after sport, uh, life outside of sport. So now so we work with lots of, current athletes, but equally we work with former athletes as well. So we've had people who have been retired from the game for a long time who couldn't tap into our services, which is great. Yeah. We offer lots of different things. We offer masterclasses ranging from transferable skills, emotional resilience, uh, how to maximise your network, working with an agent, even with parents, mm. uh, self-awareness, all these different things, working in the media. We also have, offer one-to-one coaching uh, and mentoring support for people who uh, want to do that and get, want to talk to someone outside of their, their network. We have a pracademic approach. So we're a charity, first and foremost. That's really important. We're independent as well. So no one funds us. So we, we, we rely on donations. So we have to work hard to try and get those. Mm. But our pracademic approach is me telling you about my experience. It's just my experience. Yeah. We've got uh, the pracademic part. The practitioner side is the ex-athletes, ex-coaches uh, and current athletes. But the academic side of that are people who make sure that what we deliver in our content has got academic rigor. So that it's not just experience and opinion is evidence-based so what i talk about and what we talk about our associates and deliverers talk about uh, is backed up by research so we know that um, it's, there's more credible more credibility in the space what we're doing so don't take my word for it because that's yeah. my experience this is what research says and that's a real big and important thing i think um, because we've all got our own journey your journey is different to mine uh, yeah. and to the next person's but i bet you if you look down and peel back the onion layers it'll be quite similar at different stages throughout as we go it's about Definitely. making sure we, we, we sort of highlight those parts. Of course. Um, and in terms of social media, you, can you be found on there anywhere? Yeah, yeah. So we're on LinkedIn anyway. We, we, we like to, we don't always lead conversations. We like to get involved in the conversation and bring athletes in. So we're on Twitter, uh, which is switch underscore the underscore play uh, is our Twitter handle. Um, I'm at Leon Lloyd 13 uh, and we're on LinkedIn. I say we're on LinkedIn. We always try and, engage with our athletes start uh, come to get people thinking differently be positive about transition how can we help you uh, yeah so you, anyone who wants to get involved in what we're doing then please contact us we run networking events as well and loads of free services for people brilliant um really enjoyed chatting to you today obviously we'll keep in touch going forward um mentioned obviously uh, networking and that's how i kind of came in contact with yourself uh, through networking so i'm still learning at the moment um, but yeah, really uh, appreciate obviously what you're doing. Um, obviously, it feels like you're giving back to the sport and more. Continue to do what you're doing. Um, obviously, uh, stay positive. And uh, like I said, thanks for coming on. Hope you enjoyed it.
Thanks, Danny. Really good. Hopefully we'll see one of our master classes in the near future. Hope so. I'll have to look into yeah. it. See you good soon. Thanks. Thanks, Danny. Cheers. Thanks, Thank you. Bye.